everyone. Um, thank you for joining the webinar. Uh, we're going to just give it a few minutes while uh, my team lets in the uh, participants and then we will get started. All right, well, we're already three minutes past time, so we will get started. Thank you everyone for joining me today. Um, this is the webinar, Nurturing Your Pipeline, How to Optimize Your Franchise Development Marketing for 2022. It's weird, weird to say that still. Um, so panelists will be myself. My name is Madeline Park, the Director of Marketing for NetSertive and Stephanie Salzman, the Franchise Development Manager from Threshold Brands. Steph, thank you for doing this with us today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Maddie. Yeah. So we'll do a little bit about our backgrounds. Fun fact, Steph and I actually worked together at Threshold Brands for like seven or eight years. So um, we're very familiar with working with each other and also, you know, the franchise development space. Um, a little bit about NetSertive uh, for anyone who doesn't know. We're a digital marketing partner for franchisors that implements and localizes marketing campaigns for franchisees. So we partner with franchisors. Um, we've built this proprietary software that makes localizing and implementing direct marketing for each of your franchisees really great. And the other great part is that we do full customer service. So your team's not happy to deal with all the calls from franchisees all the time. We handle that for you. Um, so yeah, a little bit about us and then a little bit about Threshold Brands. So, uh, Steph, is how long have you been with Threshold now? Well, it was originally Made Pro, but yeah. So, um, I uh, started with the uh, platform company Made Pro about nine and a half years ago, actually, uh, and then we uh, transitioned uh, into Threshold Brands earlier this year um, after an acquisition last year. So, it's been an exciting ride starting with just uh, Made Pro. And now you can see we have uh, eight different uh, concepts that we sell and, and more will, will be coming uh, as we move into 2022. Which is super exciting. And Steph and her team have, and when it was a, a smaller team, I don't know what it is now, but Steph and uh, her team have sold over, over 100 units. So she is very well versed in the sales process. And we will actually get to talk to Steph about all things sales funnel at the end of this, um, but we'll jump right in. So discussion points, just as they were listed, uh, we're going to talk about email drip campaigns, kind of messaging, graphics, CRM, uh, how that works. We'll then hit digital advertising strategy. Where are you going to put your friend dev uh, dollars and what, what's working and what's not? And then lastly, we'll get into your actual sales funnel. Uh, what's necessary and what's not. And basically what that means is, is how to streamline your sales to get candidates to the discovery days um, and not kind of losing them in the process. So a lot of hot topics, apologies if anything I cover you already know, but I'm sure you'll get a couple uh, golden nuggets out of this uh, no matter what. Uh, so first things first, email drip campaigns and I will send out this recording and the slide deck afterwards so you don't feel like you have to like quick and type everything down but um so here's a brief overview and for email drip campaigns the first thing I want to say is don't confuse the email drips with the direct messaging that comes from sales for for example um when we were at when I was at Threshold Brands Steph worked out of Salesforce and I worked out of HubSpot. So what that means is when leads came in for franchise development only, they would come in through HubSpot. Uh, and then once they were qualified, they would then go in and push to Salesforce where Steph would work her lead out of Salesforce, meaning she could handle all of her direct communication with the candidates through there. She can judge all of the steps. And then on my side in the HubSpot, is where they went into the email drip campaigns. These were pre-created, templated out, um, and timed on a nurturing drip. So first things first is those are two very, very separate things. So on the don't side right here, it's, you know, don't mistake your email drip campaigns for your direct communication with candidates because the, the sales process and the nurturing are, are very different. Um, secondly, I would say, 
keep them short. So nobody likes to scroll a ton, especially on mobile. So while I've worked with a bunch of franchises and writing email content, um, the first thing I like to say is, would you open and would you read this email? That seems super simple, but a lot of things that people forget, especially when they're working within a brand, um, specifically one, you know, you're so passionate about it, you want to get all this information and give, you know, educate them. And, and reality is you're opening emails quick scrolling, maybe once or one or two times, you know, they're not living and breathing this sales process like you are every day. So I would say at maximum, keep it, you know, two to three sentences, maybe a photo, a video, um, and, and always adding, you know, your call to action. Uh, one of our questions, uh, was around kind of the number of drips you should have and the spacing. So I'll cover that in a minute. Um, but first and foremost, keep it short. Um, second of all is for the messaging, people you have to remember are very selfish by nature. So while you may be super excited about your brand and you know we're so great because we give back to the community and we do this and we do that, the candidate is thinking, that's good. That's great. But what am I going to get out of this? Why should I own a franchise? You know, there's a million franchises out there and they're all doing good and they're all making money. You know, aside from, you know, your concept itself, you know, what are, what are they going to get out of that? And that's going to be different for every brand. When I was with Made Pro, we really focused on the ability to have work-life balance and you're not working nights and weekends. There's low entry costs. There's no inventory. So usually stuff surrounding their time um, and their money. Now, I know we can't, uh, we as in all of us franchise marketers can't discuss uh, amounts they're gonna make legally, but we would use sentences like financial freedom, uh, pictures of franchisees driving nice cars. So there is subtle messaging that you can put in there um, that kind of shows them and visualizes what they're gonna get from owning a franchise. That is the biggest thing. I think the biggest mistake is people talk about themselves and how awesome you are. And even though you are, you know, keep it centered on what the, what the candidate truly wants. And a lot of that is financial freedom, you know, lifestyle. Um, so that, and, and like I said, keeping that short. Uh, the best part about keeping it short is it gives you more uh, creative content to create more email drips, uh, you know, in your, in your nurturing process. Uh, the next uh, advice I would say is utilizing the three E's. So whenever you're creating content, it needs to either entertain, educate, or give some sort of exclusive. Uh, definitely using photos and videos is going to, to up your clip kit, click uh, rates as well. But when you're creating uh, nurturing emails, Remember, as I said in the beginning, this doesn't need to be part of the sales process. This is primarily for them to learn about your brand, to stay, you know, as a touch point. So you want to entertain them. You know, I've we we've created an email uh, that had like blooper reels from our convention. That's just something that's funny that people are going to want to see. Um, education. Uh, what are some perks of owning a, a franchise in the industry you're in? You know, what is so great about, you know, mosquitoes? It's a booming industry. Why? Um, and then, of course, during your sales process, or maybe it's the end of the year, you know, we're doing, you know, waiving the franchise fee or, you know, there's a, a veteran discount. So those are some examples of exclusives you can add. Um, but again, this is primarily to just keep your brand touching these candidates. And, and the best part about these email drips is it really takes a burden off of your sales team. If Steph was going out there and she can attest to this, having to send out all of the information on the brand and as well as trying to move all of these candidates through the pipeline, that that's just too much for one person and things are gonna fall into the cracks. Um, my next, uh, and I'll, I'll show you some examples on the next slide, but adding multiple calls to action. And this is actually really simple that I see a lot of people uh, miss. So if you have an email and you're educating, you can have a call to action that says, learn more about the mosquito and tick industry, learn more about you know the salon industry. And then at the footer, you can always have 
a call to action that's immediate, you know, click to call, schedule, hit my Zoom link here. Keep that in every email you send. That way you're not losing the opportunity um, in switching out call to actions. Maybe one goes to your website, one goes to your Facebook, one's a Zoom link. If you have the Zoom in there at all times, they never miss the opportunity, you know, when the iron is hot to just get in touch with you guys. So that's, that's another uh, main thing that I see a lot of people miss. Um, and lastly, you know, keep it current and not too cutesy. So uh, I see a lot of consumer emails that are great, that are, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk, great holiday tips for the little elves in your life. That's, that's great. Franchising candidates are talking about a major, major business in investment. So remember that there is a difference between your consumer candidates and your fran dev candidates. So asking yourself again, would you open and would you read this email uh, if you're looking to make, you know, a lifetime investment? So being mindful that these are going to be more business focused um, while you can have your brand, uh, you know, your brand voice in there. Made Pro is always very quirky. You can certainly do that. Um, but remember, you know, probably stray more towards the business side. Differences between posting on like a TikTok and LinkedIn. So, you know, that's, that's the differences we're seeing there. Um, and of course, keep it current, especially if you have a lot of nurturing emails or you're building them out. Blogs can age themselves over time. If you're linking to uh, news articles that might, you know, reference your industry or the franchising space, just be sure that they're not dating themselves. An easy way to do this is to just leave the date out of everything. Um, whenever we created movies or blogs, we tried to stray away from the date or the year just because, you know, you don't want your team to have more work having to go in and update and change things uh, in the future. The next uh, kind of example I would have is make sure your website or your landing page, wherever people are going to learn more about your franchise opportunity is not outdated. Uh, I know this is a big you know, burden, but it really, really matters. You know, Your website is your home. That is where they are gonna learn everything. That is their impression um, of you. So while you might say, we've got a great sales team and we're creating great emails. It doesn't matter if you have a call to action that says learn more at a website that's outdated to copy heavy, not user friendly. So that should be your primary um, priority if you do have these kind of outdated sites or landing pages. Um, find it in your budget, you know, move some money around, make that change because that is going to be the biggest factor in moving people through the pipeline, you know, even once they're in, they're going to continue referencing that website. They're going to have their friends and family go check out, you know, this is what I'm looking at. What do you think? Um, so that is the most important. And especially as we get into the next section, which is the digital uh, ads and SEO, you're going to want to have a solid website. Doesn't need to be complex. It just needs to be user friendly. And lastly, don't ignore your social media pages. I always get surprised at how many people click to our Facebook or Instagram page from a uh, nurturing email. They go to the footer and they click it. And it's in, I mean, numbers don't lie. They're in the analytics. So make sure even if you're not updating them on a daily basis, that at least you have the correct branding. Um, you're taking care of any reviews that are on the page, um, just so that it is a good uh, representation of your brand. The bonus is that after you have a drip campaign created, uh, you can then start segmenting your email drips into personas. So for example, at MadePro, we had a qualified drip, meaning the lead came in if they were qualified, meaning they selected, they have uh, over you know X amount of investment levels, they would go into a qualified drip that starts with the, thanks, we got your email, someone will be in touch soon. And then very, you know, all of the content we've created. Then if a salesperson selected, oh, this person is a veteran, this person is, you know, a working mom, they would then be removed from the qualified drip and go into the working mom drip, the veteran drip, the retirement drip, where then you can customize the, the content that they're specifically getting 
that is more in touch with, you know, their personal story. Um, this is a, a very large process and definitely not a huge necessity, but of course, um, if you've kind of already mastered these email drip basics, that would be your next step. Um, and there's so much opportunity there in terms of really hitting the, the pain points and the triggers uh, for each of your specific personas. Um, so here's some examples of the email drips I'm talking about. Now, these were uh, templated out, created in HubSpot. You can also do this in MailChimp, Marketo. There's, there's plenty, constant contact, plenty of uh, low cost abilities to create an email drip it can, and you know, it's a very simple process as much as it feels like it's hard. It's not as long as you're sticking to keeping it short, talking about what they're going to get, um, you know, and continuing to, to create those touch points. So these are just some examples of, for this mosquito one that I'm pointing to, this was based primarily around educating people about the mosquito and tick industry. You know, if they're interested in this, this opportunity, they're going to want to know more, they're going to want to know everything about the industry. Uh, Made Pro, here's one that we did a video where it just clicks through to, I think, a Wistia page. We used Wistia to host our, our um, videos, but you can also use YouTube. Uh, and it didn't in, uh, inline play, meaning it played right in the email, but they could click to it. Um, we had Tell Me More, and that would take us through to a, you know, about our owners page. Um, and then on this USA installation one, this was actually created by one of the agencies we worked with later. Um, they wanted a smaller drip. So for the first touch email, they would have, you know, schedule a call. Here's what comes next. This is what you're going to know and what's going to happen. Also, what would come in here is, I think in the next email was a e-brochure. So an e-brochure that they could download. It was like a downloadable version of the website, very simple, very clean. You know, they can save it to whatever they can forward it. And that was always a pretty uh, heavy hitter in terms of downloads and, you know, people referencing them. Um, and of course you can't see it on these screenshots, but at the very end, they always had a schedule call or click to, you know, speak to Stephanie um, from there. And then for those of you who use brokers, this was actually a really great thing that we created for each of our brands. Um, we did an email drip specifically for brokers. I know that it can be a handful to try and get your brand in front of all of these broker networks. They're busy, you're competing with all the brands. So what we did is as soon as a, a broker would send in a territory check or a new broker would join, we would send them an email that says, great, thanks, here's some materials to help you sell. Franchise site, com uh, uh, consumer site, you know, your marketing materials all of that stuff. So that's, you know, a little bonus there in case you haven't thought of that. Um, but, and, you know, I'll just uh, take it to Steph right now is, is Steph, what do you as a salesperson, you know, you're not really touching these marketing emails, but how important do you think they are in terms of helping you sell through the process? Yeah, I think that the, the biggest thing with the drip emails is as I'm working with my prospects and bringing them through the process, Sometimes they will tell me like, oh, I, I watched this great video that was in an email that I got. Um, so it just keeps them engaged. Uh, it gives them different perspectives on the business, uh, whether it's, you know, an owner testimonial um, or, you know, something about the process to join. But I think that it gives them the opportunity to do some of their own digging and, um, you know, have it not just be front facing with me as, as the seller, uh, just to, you know, solidify, you know, the fact that they are interested in this brand, or at least that it can help them make a better decision. Awesome. Yeah. And it definitely helps for Steph. So she's not, you know, having to do a touch point every single day. Um, and then to answer a couple questions that came in before I move on, Recommended number of drip emails. This is, uh, I would always say more is better. I would say at least try and start with three to five. You know, your first one's going to be thank you for your interest. Um, and then you can throw in, you know, one, two or three uh, of, like I said, the three E's. Here's, you know, the franchise fee cost. Here's an exclusive. Here is, uh, you know, some owner testimonials to entertain. And here's more about the industry. Um, that's a pretty simple one. Now, Made Pro. Anytime we had content, we would create a new 
uh, email for it. We have the template, so it was just drag and drop. We actually had our qualified drip, um, which had all of our content and it had about 80 to 100 emails, um, which we grew over time, uh, wasn't done all at once. But the best part of it was that people can unsubscribe as they wish, even if they're still working with the candidate. And even after, you know, franchisee or franchise candidates became franchisees, there was still looking at the emails. They still liked to get the content. They were still interested in seeing, you know, who was featured. Um, so even after uh, they might leave the process uh, or they're in limbo or they become a franchisee, the content doesn't really expire because it's not selling. It's really just, this is about our brand. Um, and then what I have found is the sweet spot um, in terms of number of days in between. So of course, as soon as the lead comes in, you're gonna sell, send them that first email right away. Uh, usually then for the next email, I rate about two to three days. Um, this is a very fragile stage because if you start sending too many right away, they are gonna think that that is your pattern and be like, nope, I'm just gonna get ahead of this now and unsubscribe. So two to three days. Then for the next one, I'm gonna wait about five business days. Um, so five to seven days, depending on, you know, where it falls. We, we had emails go out seven days a week, um, but you can always limit it to just business working days. And then once they're through that three to seven, three to five day uh, initial span, they're then going to get them every 14 days, so every two weeks, and then they're going to get them the next week, and then 14 days, and then a week. So it's kind of... Uh, two weeks, one week, two weeks, one week. That seemed to work pretty well. Not a lot of unsubscribes. Um, of course, it's it's up to you, but that is that is what I have found has worked worked pretty well. Um, while we're on email drips, does anyone want to drop in any questions in the Q&A um, or we'll just, you know, we'll just keep going. I'll keep, I'll, I'll, if you put in a question, I will answer it, but I will move on just for the sake of time. Um, all right. Digital advertising strategy. I'm just going to say it loud and proud nerd. There is no silver key. I have gone to all the conferences. I have talked to a million gajillion brands. I've worked with agencies. Uh, we had some really great leaders uh, at Made Pro before the acquisition, even after the acquisition, that have had so much experience in this. Um, and I was always saying, or being asked, or you know, saying, you know, there must be something out there that we're not doing. You know, we're our goal is to sell 50 and we're at 20 and you know there must be some kerosene I can pour on the fire that's just going to to make it go. Um, we got that kerosene through the acquisition. We had a ton more money and even then it wasn't like oh I just have more money and now all the leads are coming in. So don't kill yourself over trying to find something out there that is a hidden secret that all the big you know successful brands use because anything they're using is in front of you. Um, the top, and now this is, they're going to be brand specific and budget specific. So I'm, I'm speaking from our experience, what I've seen with other franchisees or, or franchisors, excuse me. Um, but for the most part, like I said, they're going to be right in front of you here. So the top, I would say priorities for your friend dev strategy is going to be, and in no specific order, but lead portals. So lead portals are a great way to have inbound marketing. Steph, I'm sure is banging her head against the wall because as everyone knows, lead portals send in a lot of noise and a lot of trash. Um, so you do want to be selectful with your lead portals and monitor them about every three months to make sure that the leads are coming in are one, they're utilizing your budget. Two, you're looking at them in your funnel and making sure they're not just all leaving you at the, at the beginning stage. So you want to make sure you're using lead portals that are producing to some extent. Um, again, because it's a marketplace for franchises, you're gonna get a lot of people selecting a lot of stuff. But what we did find out of this, and shout out to uh, Chuck Lynch, who was our old uh, VP of FranDev, he was the one that discovered this, is there is something called a halo effect with a lot of these uh, lead portals. Meaning when you were on them, our organic traffic grew. So whether it's people seeing your brand or you're paying to have a link to your website on there, there was something to be said for having a presence on there that directly correlated with an our organic traffic. 
Um, so that is also something to, to monitor if you're lead, turning lead portals on and off, look at those stats and see if they correlate for you as well. Um, some of the top lead portals we used were FBR, Franchise Gator, Biz Buy Sell. Um, there's, you know, there's a handful of them that are, are producing really well. But again, make sure you're staying on top of them because if you say you call up so and so at Franchise Gator and say, hey, none of my leads are going to the next step or they're not picking up the phone, usually then you'll get a little boost here or there. So make sure you're staying on top of them. Um, and again, it is a good way to continue to have your inbound leads, keeping your salespeople, uh, you know, ready, busy, and always uh, perfecting their pitch. The second is going to be SEO. So even if you don't have a big budget, you can do things to ensure that your website um, is uh, search engine optimized. Make sure that, you know, everything is tagged correctly, your headers are done right, so that when people are directly searching you, uh, you're going to show up. Uh, and that is, you know, that's something to be said for organic traffic as well. I know somebody asked, you know, how do I get more organic traffic? Well, you got to show up first and foremost. And then second of all, you got to make sure you're getting inbound links. Um, and a good way to do that is lead portals. Uh, the next will be your pay-per-click. So that is your, you know, your Google ads. Uh, Google ads for FranDev is so difficult, as all of you know. Um, we had a specialist in, and one way to do this is to bid on the top franchise keywords. So those are going to be top franchises, top franchises near me, top franchises for 2022. These are incredibly expensive keywords, but again, you have to to play, pay to play. So even if you can only select one or or something that might be a little less general, maybe, you know, um, made franchises to buy. Uh, so do some research and see the ones that you can afford. But to, in order to get more Fran Dev leads on Google, you do have to bid on those very generic keywords because that's what people are searching. Another hot tip is a lot of people are trying to do geo-targeting for Fran Dev because we're expanding in Texas or our our home office is in Texas and we want to grow from a, you know, a central radius. The, the problem is, is that that's fine, but it's going to really slow down your Fran Dev process. And that's just purely based on the number of people in that area searching for Fran Dev or, you know, franchise opportunities in Houston, Texas. It's going to be smaller than everybody in the United States searching for franchise opportunities. So I always recommend um, if you are very set on doing geo-targeting, you need to layer that in with a national campaign so that you're keep continuing to keep your, your pipeline full. And you also, you never know, people, some people are open to opening a remote office or moving or they have a family member. Um, so try to keep your options open there. I, you know, as I'm sure Seth, Steph would attest to, it's better to have too many leads than none at all. So, you know, keep that pipeline full. Uh, next, which is a big trend for 2022 and actually was a pretty hot hit um, in 2021, is social media, specifically Facebook and, and uh, Instagram. Now, the problem here is a lot of uh, CMOs and presidents and CEOs are going to say, I am seeing no leads come in from these social media ads for our franchise opportunities. It's not working. It's not working. Well, be that as it may you got to be where people are and they are on social media. So while they may not be converting from an Instagram ad or a Facebook ad, they are there and they will see you. And it is a great um, touch point to be, especially if you're going to show a, a social media ad that's, you know, click and download our brochure. That's what we always did the e-brochures and the social media ads. Um, and they did, they did pretty well. We stayed away from the uh, in, in portal, you know, type in a lead while you're in the Facebook because those were even were the worst leads of all. Um, but we did do a click to a landing page um, and that seemed to be doing really well. I would highly recommend doing that on social media, especially for Fran Dev. Like I said, you got to be where people are and that is where people are all the time. Uh, next would be referrals. So utilize your current uh, franchisees, you know, give them a referral bonus. Um, if you have more than one brand in your system, 
see if they want to open another one, uh, another, you know, fellow brand or sister brand. Um, they are going to be, you know, your biggest advocates. And um, while it might not work necessarily for, uh, t you know, territory specific, because um, they obviously aren't going to want to sell a territory that they already own. Um, you know, a lot of them have friends and family, and especially if they're doing well in your franchise system, they might want to share their love. Uh, share the love with, you know, people in their direct network. Um, next would be what we just covered, email drips. Uh, I would stay away from list buying because that can blacklist your URLs um, and never really amounts to much, but making sure that you have your email drips going. Um, and then content creation. So this means creating owner videos, creating you know, blogs, people want to learn about your brand if they are going to buy it. So as much as it is uh, a huge time suck to do content creation, if you have your annual convention, get a video camera, record some testimonials, you know, get all that content at the, when you have the opportunities so that at later times you're not trying to, you know, scrape the bottom of the barrel to create stuff. Um, so that's, that's also a suggestion I have. Secondary, and this is for the probably less emerging brands, but brokers. Brokers are a great, great way to grow your business. MadePro didn't bring them on until uh, a couple years uh, when I was with them, and primarily because we were doing the, the, the top things that I just covered, and that was great. Brokers, as much as I love them, are expensive. You know, that's usually 25000 right off the top, which if you're an emerging brand, that could be your entire franchise fee. Um, so while they are great, make sure that it makes sense for you financially. Um, and if you're using brokers, really use them, get in front of them, take them to dinner, you know, show up to their conferences, talk about your brand. Cause there's no sense in paying, you know, the fees, um, if you're not really utilizing them, uh, next would be paid placements. So, uh, banner ads, you know, we, I tend to stay away from banner ads just because they're very expensive. However, if you're trying to do a specific push, uh, we used to buy a big banner ad on entrepreneurs franchising section or FBR. So those could be some good ones for getting more organic or not, it's not organic, but getting more traffic uh, to your website. Um, you know, again, another touch point on places where people are searching for franchising. Next would be, of course, your PR. Make sure you're sending out good news, uh, anything that happens. Uh, you can also host quarterly, weekly, annual webinars, uh, and you can run you know, social media ads for them as low as a dollar a day and uh, say, hey, we're hosting a, a franchise webinar, learn more about our opportunity. That's a very low cost way to you know, get some new leads. Uh, some people like sitting on webinars. Maybe you guys do. I mean, you're sitting on one right now. So uh, another fun option for you guys to do. Uh, retargeting, setting up retargeting ads for the people that are already at your site so you can follow them around and, and you know hopefully get a conversion then. Um, portal emails, which, and by this I mean, you can actually do sponsored emails through lead portals, which is a good way to hit uh, you know a big list of people specifically uh, interested in franchising. Um, without having to buy a list or just utilize the database you have. Uh, and then LinkedIn ads. I, I put in LinkedIn because I don't want to ignore them, but uh, I have tried with big budgets, small budgets, product, service. LinkedIn ads just don't work. They're not working right now. Uh, I'm sure all of you know, in-mail ads are very annoying, very intrusive. They're getting a million a day. Um, and while LinkedIn seems like the perfect place uh, to get a candidate, it's just not there yet. Uh, and we haven't really seen movement on that in the last two or three years. They're super expensive. Um, I've even tried it with the in portal, you know, submit a lead. So, um, and the agencies I've worked with have seen the same thing. So while you wanna be active on LinkedIn, I'd be cautious with uh, spending money there because it doesn't return very high. Um, and also their banner ads or box ads are going to be less effective than just utilizing that that same budget on Facebook and Instagram because those same people are there and they're probably there more. Um, so to answer that question on LinkedIn, I would be tread lightly there. 
Um, and then tertiary would be mailers, print, guerrilla marketing, such as billboards. Uh, you know, the only time we've ever really done print or mailers was when we were doing a conversion um, campaign, meaning we wanted to target people who already owned a business um, and see if they wanted to convert to our franchise. So we would send out a mailer. Um, we did buy a list to follow up, and then we were going to send out a secondary mailer. Uh, COVID kind of stopped this, as <laughs> Steph can attest, um, but we did get out the first mailers, um, got a couple of responses back, uh, nothing through the roof. So that is an option for you, but again, probably if you're going to put money somewhere, it's probably better in the, the top or the secondary uh, categories here. Um, and last thing, what I talked to a lot of people about um, that I, I skipped over, sorry, was is trade shows. So, and I don't mean trade shows as in the IFA and HubSpot, I mean like actual franchise expos. So, uh, and I'll let Steph talk about this in a second, but I like them because they are an influx of leads in an area that you might want to be in. But if you're specifically relying on them as one of your top ways to get leads, I don't think it's worth the budget. And I say this because you're going to an expo where it's just an in-person lead portal. You know, there's hundreds of franchises there to choose from. They're throwing business cards. They're there for some free stuff. Um, so while you might get an influx of leads for a specific area, which could be great, we were trying to grow in Toronto and we actually got one out of Toronto, which was awesome. Um, but usually those shows run anywhere from five to $15,000. If you're taking that amount of money and putting them into one of these other top things, you're probably going to get more qualified leads um, that are, you know, spaced out rather than you know one specific place. Um, and then Steph, I just want you to chat real quick about what it's like as a salesperson at those expos. Um, it's a lot. I didn't have to do the selling or talking. I just had to set it up, but Steph had to do it, and God bless her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was definitely a busy day. Um, trade shows, I mean, hey, if you get one franchise from a trade show, the trade show pays for itself. So like Maddie said, if you really are looking to get a location in a specific area, it could be a good opportunity if you have the budget for it. Um, I would definitely recommend doing something a little bit unique with your booth because there are so many options for prospects to look at. Um, we had like a mini golf with a raffle, um, anything that you can do to kind of entice people to come over, I think is a great place to start. Um, and then like we were, uh, you'll be busy all day. Um, and like Maddie said, we did actually get a unit from that trade show. So it did pay off for us. Yeah, definitely a good point. So yeah, if you're doing a trade show, you know, goal with a goal in mind, not just, oh, this is going to fill my pipeline for the year. Um, you know, hopefully it's in the area that your trade show is at. And again, like Seth said, do something fun and flashy so that you are getting as many of, uh, of those business cards and contacts as you can. Um, all right, so we'll go into our last topic, which is the actual sales funnel, meaning, you know, what's necessary and what's not. I've talked to a lot of uh, franchise development people and, you know, the processes span a whole wide variety of time and, you know, key activities that they're doing. Um, as Steph has said, she did it, she's done it for a decade, over a decade now. So, you know, they've really, <laughs> they've really honed in on, you know, what's going to move people through that process. So I'm going to give you a couple tips here and then Steph's kind of going to talk about uh, her thoughts on that next. So my first is separate what's marketing and what is sales. There is crossover, but you should be able to draw a line in the sand. An example of this is the nurturing emails versus the sales emails. Um, you know, who's responsible for what so that it doesn't always just fall on your sales team or your marketing team. Um, so you can really put responsibilities in place um, and make sure they're fulfilled. The second is then take a look at your sales activities and place them into a funnel. Um, so see the exact sales process. What are, what are the biggest steps that are going to make them move through the funnel to a sale and put them kind of in place? Uh, and then you're going to take a deep dive into act, each activity or key moment, fine tune to what works best for you and your sales team and your ideal candidates, whether that is you know, a call and then three weeks or having a call with a specific person, um, you know, 
test, uh, you know, what kind of things are you're comfortable with, your team's comfortable with, uh, and what's going to work the best. After that, then you're going to layer in your marketing touch points. Um, so Steph has her process, then she's layering in, you know, how they're getting their email drips through this. Are they going to get any more touches? Um, are we going to send them any t-shirts or, you know, where does that fall? Um, so then you can take a look at your whole funnel and see, you know, am I doing the most I can do uh, for each of these candidates? And then over time, you want to fine tune it. Look at your analytics. So the best part about email drips is they're always going to come with analytics. You can see what content they're loving. You can see if they're going back to the site. You can see if they're following you on social media. So make sure that you're looking at those analytics so that you can use the best things that are working and optimize for them. Um, and then of course, keep a pulse on your sales team to put them in the best position to sell. You know, if all of this stuff fell on Steph and her team, she's not going to be as effective as if she's just responsible, you know, for her funnel or specific stuff. So, um, the salespeople are, you know, they are the persona of your business. Um, so you want to make sure that not one, you have the right people and two, you know, you're taking care of them, which I think a lot of people forget because they're like, oh, it's just salespeople. They, the more they sell, the more commission they can make. But it's a hard job. I like, I can't sell, I would give away everything for free. So make sure you're checking in with them um, to ensure that, you know, they're, they're happy and gonna be able to promote you. Um, so I'm gonna just ask some questions from Steph and then uh, we'll go ahead and uh, open the questions. Steph does have a candidate call at two, so I'm gonna be a little bit quick with these. Um, but of course you can follow up with us via email if you have any specific questions after. Um, so Steph, what does your sales process look like with Threshold Brands and how long is a typical sales cycle? Yeah, so one thing is, you know, I've definitely seen the evolution of our sales process, you know, starting with MadePro when there were 135 franchisees and we've, you know, we have like almost 300 now. So it's definitely um, changed over the years, uh, depending on, you know, how mature we have been as a business. Today, what this looks like is we actually um, have a qualifier who really works with like those portal leads, gives me a lot more free time to focus directly on organic leads as well as broker uh, referrals. Um, but, you know, we do an introductory call with qualified um, candidates. We get our FDD out really early in the process, uh, just so that that's not a sticking point for people and make sure to do um, a comprehensive review call and also do a territory uh, mixed in there as well so that there's something exciting along with the FDD review. Um, and then we make a point to um, share, go into depth with marketing and operations and really how we're going to support franchise owners in those spaces. Um, previously, we had specific marketing coaches and business coaches do those calls individually. I think there's a ton of value for the prospect to be able to get to know different people on the support team you know, through their discovery process. What we've also found is now that we're at a point of really accelerating our growth, not as necessarily as scalable. So I actually take over those calls now and I do them in depth. Um, I think if you wanted to try both, you could always A-B test and kind of see what the results look like. The other thing is that our marketing and business coaching team is always available to me if I need them um, for a specific candidate. Uh, again, if I think that that's going to be a big win to help move them along through the process. Um, other than that, validations, like I can't, you know, say how important validations are. And I know that that's one of the points here that we're going to talk about, but connecting our owners or excuse me, our prospects with owners, um, just so that they can get to know them is a key part of the process before the last step, which is decision day or discovery day or a tour, whatever you decide to call it, um, which is the last, uh, step so that, you know, prospects can get to know the whole team, make sure that it's something that they want to move forward with. Um, our goal for timeline here is around 45 to 60 days. I have definitely worked with people for longer than that. I think the longest sales cycle I've gone through was over a year with someone. Um, but I think keeping a goal of around two months is a good sweet spot, gives the prospect enough time to really digest the information, make sure it's something that they feel good and confident about, but it's not so long that, you know, we all know that you know time time kills all deals, so we want to keep it nice and concise. That's great. 
Um, and I've heard Steph on the calls for years and she is a rock star. So anything she's saying, definitely write it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, and then uh, before the acquisition, they were meeting with these key individuals, uh, specifically either the CEO or the president. Um, why did you guys do that? Why was it important to do prior to the discovery day? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it really helped set the tone for who we are as a franchisor and, and how committed we are to our franchise owners. Um, again, you know, we had more time for our key individuals, founders, marketing coaches, business coaches to spend that time with our owners because we were a little bit smaller. Um, so especially if you're an emerging style brand, I, I, I would recommend it at least again on an as needed basis. Um, it makes prospects feel really good, you know, especially if you have a founder um, speaking with them, they, you know, can ask, you know, really good detailed questions and uh, get to know, you know, the founder and their goals, make sure that they're aligned, you know, as, as they move into a partnership with one another. That's awesome. Um, and then moving right along. So you talked about franchisee validation. What does the process look like? Did you pre-select franchisees when someone called? Do you use a code code word? How how many did they do? What did that look like? Yeah, so this is an area that you do want to be careful with um, legally. Uh, you don't want to be directing people to specific franchise owners uh, in case you know something weird happens on the back end, and then they say, "Oh, you only you know shared X Y Z franchisee with me," and they're like the best you know, in the system. So um, we do offer, we provide passwords to our prospects so that they can verify directly with owners, um, you know, that they are in fact working with us and not secret shoppers. I typically give them, they are free to reach out to as many owners as they would like. We have the directory in the back of the FDD. They're free to go at it. Um, a lot of people will request um, assistance because it is a lot, especially when you have a hundred plus owners in your system. Um, so I'll always, you know, let them know if they wanted to speak with new owners or local owners or owners with similar backgrounds, you know, as, as the prospect, that's something that I can assist with. I also love when they do validations and franchisees will recommend that they speak with a different franchisee. I think that's the best. Um, but I do try to stay relatively hands off again, unless if a prospect requests it. Um, and I'm always sure to keep in writing that they did request a certain connection um, just so that we're, we're safe from, uh, from the legal side of things. Awesome. And uh, my fiance actually owns a whole bunch of franchises that Steph sold to him. So that if that gives you any in, insight <laughs> into how well she is at her, well, does well at her job. Um, but uh, I always would be worried, you know, are the franchisees gonna be annoyed, but he loves to take them. He wants to expand the brand. So uh, knowing that, you know, they have access to see, you know, who else could join the family and, uh, you know, having that kind of connection with the franchisor, I think is great. Uh, Steph, did you have any other recommendations for handling, you know, the franchisee side of it? Like, did we tell, do you tell them they're going to expect a call? What does that look like? Generally not. Like uh, the, the, agreements, you know, when you're joining a franchise, you are joining a system, you are joining a community, you are going to engage with your home office support staff, also your franchise community to get support. That also means that you're going to be giving support in return. So many franchise owners, they all, they know what that felt like when they were going through the process, when they were trying to figure out if it was a good fit for them. So I find that most owners are very generous with their time. Um, I have also had a couple owners that, you know, have reached out to me and said, hey, can you please like omit me from any sort of list? Like now's not a good time for me or, you know, I'm going through a personal thing, um, you know, and that way we can make sure to be respectful there. But um, you know, I always tell people, you know, reach out to whomever you would like, don't hesitate to ping them twice if they don't respond because they're busy and running businesses. And if you're having issues connecting, that's when I'll step in and I'll either reach out directly to a, an owner to see if they have time, um, or I'll direct them to other franchise owners. That's great. Um, and then, uh, what are your touch points look like? So, like we said, we covered the nurturing stage. How many times do you contact a candidate between calls or key moments? Um, and at what point are you gonna put them in limbo? And once they're in limbo, what happens? 
Yep. So if they're doing like a, um, a key individual call or they're going through a big milestone in the process, I want to get in touch with them same day or day after is always my goal. Um, but generally, you know, if I'm having to kind of chase my prospects through the process, um, you'll always get a, you should be getting to know your prospects. And, and um, sometimes I can tell if they're picking up during certain times of the day or certain days of the week are better for them. But otherwise, I do a touch point every two to three business days. I don't like much time going between communications um, unless if, you know, we, we set a proper expectation that, hey, we're not going to connect until X date. Great. And then um, when your candidate goes into limbo, meaning they dropped off the process or they want to wait, um, do you keep contacting them? Do you keep them in limbo? What do you do then? Yeah, so this is where I definitely lean on those uh, drip campaigns because I don't honestly want to be wasting my time with somebody who isn't going to move through the process. Um, I have over the years, I've definitely moved towards being a little bit more I won't say ruthless, but I, I, I am, I'm swift to move people out of my pipeline if they're just taking up my time. Um, I've definitely gotten more direct with some of my communications with people like, hey, are you still interested? I don't want to continue any unnecessary, unnecessary follow-ups. Those types of voicemails or emails, I usually get a lot of responses from if people are like, hey, this just isn't going to work for me or no, I'm not interested anymore. Um, if someone were, say, delayed with their funding or, you know, had a personal situation come up and that's why we're moving them into limbo, you know, I'll, I'll connect with them after the agreed upon date. Um, I'll probably send out six to seven touch points being voicemail and email a combination of that and then just close them out. Awesome. Um, yeah, so that is a masterclass on limbo for you. Be direct, people. Don't, you know, like Steph said, you don't want to waste your time with people who aren't going to, you know, aren't serious about it. And then I know Steph has a call in five minutes, but lastly, what are your thoughts on being selective with franchise candidates? I'm sure it's so tempting to take anyone who walks in the door, um, but why is that not a good idea? It is. It is. It, it can. It can be tough. Um, some, especially if you're seeing someone moving through the process and you're like, "Gosh, I just don't know about this person." Um, that's definitely where checks and balances come into play with the rest of your team, um, the executive team, the other, you know, support team members to make sure that you know they're seeing what what your sales team is seeing um, and make sure that that they are seeming like a good fit. Um, but you know, I, I think at the end of the day, that's always to, you know, if you get to the point of decision day and, and it's just not feeling right, it's always better to um, say no than, you know, move forward with something that you're feeling like is a red flag because it will bite you in the bum, like with validation. It's a huge headache for your support team. Um, then you have to deal with potential, you know, termination or transfer. And they always end up taking up, you know, way more of, of your business's time than that you could otherwise redirect towards owners that are happy and growing. So, um, you know, it's not to say you don't take chances on people because that's what we have to do. Uh, but if, if you're seeing glaring red flags, save yourself. <laughs> save yourself, people. Um, Steph, did you have any other advice for people out there? Uh, maybe they're a franchise developer or trying to build a team um, before we let you go? Um, yeah, I did. I, I saw one question come in through the chat. So I just wanted to make sure that I could oh, um, answer that. It was, it was at what point in the funnel do you think it's good to connect a, a candidate with a founder? I would definitely say later in the stage, just because, you know, the founder probably has a lot going on in their day to day. We don't want to be, you know, filling up a founder's, you know, calendar with prospect calls if they're not really serious. Um, so, and, and these, these founder calls or key individual calls, I really would say it's totally up to you. I think that you can have a really successful, um, sales process without them, as long as you're communicating the value of your, your franchise business, um, and, you know, showing them the type of support that they have. If you want to, you know, have them come in again on an as needed basis, Later on in the process, um, especially just to get them to commit to decision day, I think is, is a good time to get them in there. Perfect. And look at that timing. Well, um, I know I said we have uh, ask your franchise development questions, but um, here is her email. <laughs> 
uh, we, I want to, you know, make sure we stay on time for everyone. Uh, but feel free to connect with myself or Steph. Uh, our emails are there. We're on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I, I'm really trying now that I'm not in a specific brand, trying to, you know, connect the franchise space because I think, you know, all of our minds together are better than just trying to figure it out ourselves. Um, if you have anyone interested in some great brands, also contact Steph. Um, and of course, if your franchise has any, uh, you know, marketing questions or franchisee marketing uh, uh, openings or you need some help, uh, NetSertive can definitely do that for you as well. Um, but Stephanie, thanks again. It was so fun to kind of work with you again. Uh, I miss you. No, and we will great. definitely <laughs> get drinks when I'm back in Boston. But um, thanks a lot, everyone. Again, I'll send out the slides and the recording. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful holiday.